Pradeep. Actually, we have uh, today a very special person here. Um, we all let us uh, welcome Professor Satyadinki along with uh, his student, Dr. Siddharth, um, who recently got know him that much. Uh, uh, so I just want to say that the uh, for, first and foremost thing, I, I actually, he is also a student of you. You see there, uh, Professor Lord Julian Hunt. See this uh, name, if you are a fluid uh, dynamics, uh, you would know that name because he, many of the um, uh, the theories, uh, whatever we are talking about, uh, actually was, uh, is from coming from there. And he worked with uh, two very key professors. Other uh, professor is uh, Professor Jonas. And um, uh, these names are uh, very uh, actually uh, uh, like a very respected uh, professors in the field. And uh, I must say that uh, you I mean, probably you have seen his introduction. I just uh, read out for uh, your knowledge again. Uh, Professor Bosch specializes in the application of fluid mechanics and uh, cloud microphysics over, over urban environments. He holds visiting position at the School of Earth and Environment, uh, University of Leeds, UK and uh, also at the Velour Institute of Technology, BIT, Velour. And uh, his uh, earlier substantiated positions include uh, senior research associateships at the Department of Applied Mathematics and uh, Theoretical Physics yes. and uh, university at uh, University of Cambridge and the University of Manchester. He was awarded as ASL Editor's Award by Royal Meteorological Society for interesting, enthusing uh, young Indians into the into meteorology. He is an elected fellow, fellow of Royal Meteorological Society and uh, has been an associate editor of Atmospheric Science Letters over 15 years. Um, he will be giving a talk today on consciousness of uh, uh, built environment actually uh, the he has a different perspective to share with us uh, we will uh, listen from him today and uh, let us again welcome professor Roach in this uh, talk of interest to all of us thank you very much we will stand up for a bit to express my gratitude to iitn and especially to dr tara prabhakaran and all the senior scientists who are only hear about through the media and the papers and international forums. It's such a joy and a privilege. I hope um, the takeaway message from this talk uh, will resonate very deeply with the IITM ethos. So without much ado, I'll briefly explain uh, why I have used this phrase terraforming. So those of you who are new to this um, genre of literature, we use terraforming uh, in the context of planetary missions when we want to make a mission to Venus or to Mars uh, to bear a semblance to Earth. So we, we terraform that surface. But also terraforming is increasingly being used that you know the surface topography of planet Earth also is undergoing a quite a radical change because of rampant unregulated urbanization so and that has catastrophic consequences so we want to avert that and this era of the anthropocene, uh, anthropocene the word anthropocene was coined by a nobel laureate again not many climate scientists are given nobel prizes but professor paul Crutzen, he coined this phrase Anthropocene, that there's uh, this now this unmistakable evidence that human activity has changed planet Earth. So therefore, you know, we had all these uh, era of, uh, you know, the dinosaurs and various other eras, long duration eras. But we have now an era where human beings 
are making a distinct, deleterious imprint on our planet. And uh, so that's what the talk is going to be all about. But there will be an emphasis on how to relate high-end fluid mechanics and meteorology in a wider context, because I've used the word averting in the title of my talk. Yeah. So basically, <clears throat> I'll first introduce you to a world in this author. I'm sure many of you might have read him. Um, Amitav Ghosh, he, he wrote this book, The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable. And uh, in the list of references, there are several IITM papers that he mentions in this uh, hugely famous book. And he's trying to premise that unless we take this issue very seriously, global warming and climate change, especially the consequences it has on livelihoods, it will be irreversible. And so artists and writers and dramatists and filmmakers, social scientists and economists should come together. And especially he, he sort of alludes to the role of high literature. He, he's saying that literature in the form of epic literature should be retained to bring about a change in the public consciousness. So the Guardian, which is quite a left-wing newspaper, even the Guardian uh, liked Amitabh Ghosh's work. And this recent book, The Nutmeg's Curse, um, so he got the Gandhi Award. Uh, he uses the word terraforming quite frequently in this work, where he is referring to the impact of colonization how entire society, especially yeah. in Indonesia, where entire society was obliterated for economic gains by the planters uh, from, from colonization, Dutch colonizers and British colonizers. So that's what he said. And uh, so I will be touching a little bit about, you know, that's where IITM can come in a very big way in altering public consciousness. Yes. So terraforming, what, what is the most obvious impacts of terraforming so far? Our cities have become extremely hot. The urban heat island effect, it's, it's tangibly and visibly perceptible, especially during the lockdown. I also spent a lot of time in Velo, where we have hundreds and thousands of outdoor food vendors. And they have to vend food on trolleys um, in the harsh sunshine. And the British Medical College, we, we have worked with them, they have told us the impact of heat stress on these people who are working outside is tremendous. So here are some statistics. And also Siddharth and I, we did some study on, you know, mm -hmm. towns that you see here. Um, so those are the people uh, who are catering to the unregulated labor force in India. And this is for the Chennai city, and they use all kinds of archaic, uh, booking modes, that is releasing a lot of soot and black carbon. You know, these are short-lived climate forces, they're black in color, and because they are black, they absorb radiation and they cause local heating, and IITM scientists have already done deep research in this area. So we will be talking a little bit about each community, uh, and there are papers to say that some of these processes are impacting cyclones as well. A table on the left, which I always use for my lectures, I didn't do this here for this August audience, just to emphasize that the freshwater quota that we have is actually quite minuscule. So from that table, it comes from the atmosphere as fresh water. If you com compare the trace ratio with how much of fresh water is held in the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet, um, it is minuscule. But what is very important, I do not know if IITM scientists have worked, the crust and the mantle, they hold the maximum amount of water. But the only thing is to it's so deep down to extricate it, to, to have technology to dig that deep 
So the, we will almost have an unlimited supply of water. And uh, this is an El Nino here, and the IM, IMD has said the monsoon will be plus minus 96%, but there have been years when the monsoon have failed. Um, and I've given a record to that in 1877. Has that record been exceeded? The 1877 El Nino was strongest strong record. So this is. So I'm still in the part of the context department of some reason. I think, okay. So about please switch it off. I'm so sorry. Um, yes. So I've given some facts about um, how a failed monsoon or a very dry year is going to impact vulnerable, very vulnerable people. I think so we've seen that. Okay, thank you. So the the rich farmers are not going to be affected. The, the, the farmers who are poor are going to be severely affected with this water stress. And um, so we in Leeds, we are currently looking at the impact of geoengineering uh, experiments on uh, the farming community. That's why we're trying to use drones and to see uh, if new technology will, if we spray water, uh, not seeding, I'll come to the seeding, but localized spraying of water, is that, is that going to help? So these are some of the issues that terraforming on issues. But the most dramatic unleashing happens about uh, glacial melting, and that is going to impact uh, billions of millions of Indians. And people on people at the British Antarctic Survey, they have come to um, the Himalayas to look at the thawing of the glaciers with their experience of um, quantifying changes deep in the ice cores. They want to do some studies on the Himalayan glaciers. And um, the picture on the top right, this is part of Siddharth's work. We, we are trying to see on a mesoscale transport of vehicular pollution from sort of untransformed soot and black carbon from malfunction, mal malfunctioning vehicles of Indian cities. A trajectory analysis suggests that they are landing themselves even on the Himalayan snows. So all of this, in a concerted way, is impacting not only local microclimates, but also large parts of our country. So this is um, the Dudi Koshi watershed in the Himalayan region. And this is some of the work that is going on in Cambridge in England. So they're trying to find out how this watershed is changing in this era of the Anthropocene. And Siddharth did this simulation where he integrated, he had a double moment scheme. And um, this is the war front, but he, have you included particles in this? So, so we might want to do particles in this. And so the interesting thing that is emerging is uh, in the Duti Koshi watershed, Abundant rainfall is happening over certain areas and extremely lean uh, patches in certain others. So this disparity, abundance versus leanness, is it going to impact livelihood? So the answer is yes. And this needs a, a different kind of exploration. So the proven engineering solutions, so I use the word averting ter terraforming, so we have already taken a step forward in geoengineering experiments. IITM is deeply, deeply involved in, in, in releasing rain showers in the lean districts of India. So that is a direct engineering intervention, which uh, Dr. 
Dr. Tara Prabhakaru leads and her, her paper with Andrea Flotton, Rain Enhancement Through Cloud Seeding. So that induces precipitation in the areas where precipitation is very lean. And uh, this was a recent article which Dr. Cole, and I'm sure both of you will agree that some of it is human induced, what we are seeing. Uh, largely, the large scale dynamical forcings are not human induced, but other localized forcings are human induced. Maybe with caution, I can say that. So we have to combine all of this. And uh, so localized geoengineering interventions with what Tara does, does help in averting terraforming. But on a global scale, maybe I should, in, I should invite responses. So I don't know if IITM agrees that marine cloud brightening is the only solution. Um, I'll briefly, so the students, do you know what's marine cloud, cloud brightening? Roughly, all of you, shall I briefly explain what it is all about? Shall I? Yes. Yes. As the name suggests, um, what happens is when the sun uh, is sending down short wave ultraviolet radiation. So if you have a reflecting surface, it will send, it will scatter back radiation, depending on the size of the droplets. It will scatter back radiation to outer space. Just like today, because there is a cloud cover, we are so cool and comfortable. So the idea is, can we have a blanket stretched to the upper troposphere so that reflection happens, it scatters particles back to the, the ultraviolet, back to space, and we feel warm inside. So I was in England about three weeks ago, again in Dan Hugh Hunt, uh, the several people at Steve Barrett from MIT, they're seriously thinking of conducting marine cloud. So one of the easiest way to inject droplets into the upper troposphere, which will act as a reflecting surface, would be to inject salt water. That is plenty available, but the spraying mechanism should be right. So that, you know, there's upper level stratification and a jet should be under its spread for the maximum coverage. So that's what, so these are some of the papers, but uh, there are two methods. So did you understand the whole purpose is simply, it's mainly to scatter back radiation to outer space to have a cooler, uh, uh, sort of lower boundary layer. So some of the papers, some of them are aircraft based, as you see in the picture. You can release uh, salt water droplets or the more expensive ones. I mean, you have huge towers and then you spray them from huge towers and uh, at the right point of spray. But then you have to deal with mixed aerosol impacts, which is my area of research. So Tara's experiments, you want runaway growth. You want aerosols to quickly grow into large droplets so that it causes rain. But this is an antithesis of that, that happens. You do not want the rain. You want the water droplets to stay as clouds and not rain. So we do not want, so that's the difference. And this is Santhal's work and we, you know, the, the black line on the graph are vehicle emissions sandwiched between ammonium sulfate and sea salt particles. So even during MCB, marine cloud background, so the background aerosol will have to mix with all kinds of aerosols, which we have to model. So is that clear? Shall I proceed further? Yes. I just want to mention that uh, this is an interactive talk, uh, sir. Uh, you know, if you have questions, yes. you can come up and uh, discuss. Yes. So I had the, I, I, I was taken to uh, <laughs> the fluid mechanics lab. Professor Dixit showed me how 
So basically, I mean, visiting your lab was so exciting. You. I want comments on this and to what extent, you know, if you have to do MCB. So what I, why I want to mention about you, there's a very deep fluid mechanical connection with everything that you're doing. Um, you know, some of my work with the farmers, we, we, there was a paper that I had written with Julian Spray Jetson Frostle a long time ago. Um, so we developed that into a in, into a product. I think it was an IIT and scientist who reviewed that patent. It was it you? Okay. <laughs> right. Maybe, maybe, uh, uh, Dr. Kamara. Yes. So anyway, the patent was so so this. The fluid, an example of a fluid mechanic, you know, when you're growing orchids, they are used to natural rain showers. You know, a natural rain shower has a certain unique drop size distribution. So, but a sprinkler, a hose, they, would, they wouldn't feel comfortable being sprayed with. So the difficulty is to get the shape of the drop size distribution right with an artificially sprayed mechanism. And uh, but there are the second important thing is when you spray upwards with such a lot of droplets, there is an entrained air jet, and the strength of the air jet, the air jet is actually driving the droplets, and as you go further away, the strength of the jet decreases, and perhaps and if you have a cross flow, <laughs> then it will interact with this cross flow. So we, we provided solutions for a spray jet, which is a droplet. And we, we found that they behave quite differently in different zones. So it's still not clear when we, when we do MCB, uh, which zone would be most effective in causing the spread upwards for maximum aerial coverage. So some of these flows are relevant to metal. So that, that's the comment that, that's made here. So this is a pre-study uh, for marine cloud patterning operations. The discharge rate is given here, and um, <clears throat> with the simulation work. My very clever student, he did this simulation, especially for this lecture. So if you release water droplets, you can see the effects of mixing the outer peripheries, you have a spreading of the droplet mixing with the updraft speeds. So what, what is to be emphasized is a lot of background high-end CFD computational fluid dynamic simulations have to be undertaken before we venture upon. Um, is IITM thinking of marine cloud battling? Yeah. Right now, <laughs> actually, um, right now, maybe we should not uh, comment on that. On that, okay. Okay. Sure, sure. okay. But uh, I think eventually it has to be done if it is really to kill people. That's the easiest way to cool down. That's the result of terraform. In fact, yeah, yeah. What about the lifetime of this? Um, Plates or whatever being sprayed out. Yes. Because uh, it may not uh, you know, last long. Uh, again, you have to regenerate them for any positive effect or negative effect. And then yes, that's them. that's such an interesting question. You know, we want the cloud to be spread and hang around for a very long time. And that will happen only if we spray very light, small, small size droplets with atmospheric residence times to, up to days to a week. So the smoke stain settling velocities are very small. So injecting light particles. So the answer is days to weeks. Days to week. Yes. So the sort of main diameter is a, yeah, this is tied to your question. You know, we must know the sort of main diameter before we inject uh, droplets. And we should look at the changes in the supersaturation profile. So we, we do not want runaway formation of rain. We do not want a hastened autoconversion. 
So we can do parcel model studies and we have all the facilities in India to do pre-studies before we do a full scale NCD. So um, some of you work on cyclones. This is not related to marine cloud battling, but uh, again, an effect of ter terraforming. So, Dr. Paul's paper said the people have commented that cyclones are forming more frequently over Arabian Sea. Earlier, we thought it was only the Bay of Bengal where cyclones form because of the bathymetry and the warmer seaside temperature. But um, this was one of my papers. Um, uh, with may I comment on educational? Yes. So basically, being a university professor, and many of you are young people. It is very nice to do short term projects, not a full PhD program. So these short term projects that I did with my engineering students help them get scholarships to Oxford and Cambridge and full funded straight scholarships after we take. This is one such study. It was his project. So the whole idea was to use a, a fleet of naval artillery, artillery ships and use special sprays to spray salt droplets at the base of a cyclone and to induce runaway autoconversion so that the rain happens over the ocean before it makes landfall over the sea. And this received a lot of media attention. And the idea is very simple. It's, it's similar to what Dr. Tara Prabhakar does in seeding. When this is seeding, with the, you have to go deep down into the ocean and the kind of a spraying mechanism. So I'll play a little video here just to. Just a schematic. This was part of the project. The students did this as well, apart from the real experiment. So you can see that the drop size distribution is spreading to larger sizes, which will form collision and coalescence and then rain. And that's it. Yes. Next slide. Okay, well, I see. So we have done walk simulations with and without the <clears throat> injection just to so show so that show that it is dissipating over the Bay of Bengal before it's making landfall. This working. Yes. So for the society of sure. yeah, yeah, sure. We are quite interested in that. So so what what was the difference? Yes, so it's not very clear. You have to look at the yellow band. Uh, uh, yeah, if you look at it very carefully, so that can you go and mark the Indian subcontinent? If I had a pointer, can you see the peninsular India? Yeah, yeah. So there are differences in the yellow bands. With those are the regions of the most intense precipitations. So one one injection. Uh, is moving the intensest precipitations. It's it's not touching Chennai. It's not very clear. We should we should do them separately, but I can send you the paper where everything. Sir, I have yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we might have a different realizations of this. It's because it's a huge system. Right? Yeah. It might uh, it might be so that uh, there are different realizations. So how do you uh, like uh, only doing two simulations will not help. Right. So we we will have to introduce that uh, different realizations in the picture. How will you? Uh, that's, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. 
Uh, I mean, the only thing for this study, we can say that we have done some validation with the, only with the vertical profiles of uh, the total moisture and the liquid water content and the waves. We, have, we, we haven't been able to do any other validations. Uh, in the, all such studies, the uh, main problem is uh, validation is very complex. Yes. Um, actually, we will not be dealing with the same cloud, same, no, uh, no. same system. There is a, we have to uh, probably even numerically also, we have to do it uh, in numerous, numerous uh, number of times to come up with uh, some robust. Uh, yes. But, um, that's I completely understand that before it's uh, sent out as a proven mechanism, much more cautious studies have to be done. But there is unmistakable evidence, uh, even for a very long time, you know, this adage, oil on troubled water. So when ships were drowning a long time ago during, uh, so they would just pour their barrels of oil on on an ocean surface to calm down. Um, so basically what we're doing is, see the water vapor is the fuel for, for a carnal cycle that is feeding energy to a cyclonic storm. So you're cutting off the fuel by pouring water, we're pouring oil. So, uh, but there's unmistakable evidence if you are even at the base, inside a cyclonic storm, if you are injecting large droplets, which is heavily moist, the cooler mm -hmm. theory will be biased towards uncontrolled growth. That is well established, surely, isn't it? But on a very large scale, what will be the total effect? We do not know. I completely agree with you. At least from this limited, uh, limited uh, experiment, how far away from the landfall and how how many days before the landfall was was it introduced? Yes, yes. So so basically, uh, we found that before it struck the coast of Chennai, almost seventy five percent of the TK was dissipated. The winds calmed down considerably, and most of the rain showers happened on the Bay of Bengal, only touching a bit on the periphery. When was this introduced as well, the power engineering? This, this, this is only a Gedakian experiment. It's only so a... Is it immediately after Genesis? So I want to know when, like, so this the seeding was done I see. three days before or five days it, before? And four. First thing, let me clarify, we never went and seeded on a day. Yes, the experiment. In, in, this, in this numerical experiment, yes. I think... Um, the wolf tells us five days in advance. So basically, the, the warning systems that we issued even for before, roughly, you know, five days in advance, what will be the track and uh, what will be the maximum wind speeds. So was this cyclone Thani? I can't, can't remember. No, no. Maybe, okay. maybe in the February. Yeah, you know. Yes. So, so, so roughly when it is so it advances very slowly. Generally, it takes days to come, at least four or five days. So the, we, we are proposing the injection has to, is to be done when we have a sufficient amount of cloud droplets that are 20, greater than 20 microns diameter. That's the cutoff limit. So only when maybe a radar will tell when you have 20 micron diameter cloud droplets, because that is the threshold. When you inject giant particles, the larger droplets, they collide and coalesce. So the answer to your question is four to five days when you do the injection, when it's growing up, it takes some time to, to, to have water vapor condens into droplets. Because it's a cyclone, um, of the Bay of Bengal, the moisture levels would be very high and the temperatures would be very warm. 
I don't know if I answered your question properly, but vaguely, Roxy. Yeah, I got some idea. Yeah. I was also thinking that once, I mean, if, if like for, compared to the, uh, the, the, what you call the control experiment, if the 75% decay is compared to the control experiment, then uh, might have chances of uh, changing the track as well of this thing. I haven't explored that. Maybe we can discuss this later. Can I ask? Yes, please. Cyclones are important for many, many factors. And all those things have to be. I mean, somebody can play around, divert that monsoon also subsequently later to some other area. So it's been, we've got a lot of risk, especially if, if this really works. And uh, I believe uh, as per W so certain um, guidelines. So as per the guidelines, uh, only in limited area, in even in the cloud seeding also, only in limited area it is uh, proposed. But not on very heavy weather systems and all. So there is absolutely, uh, absolutely uh, they stopped uh, all these activities uh, during that. Uh, oh, there was one uh, cyclone, I mean, so hurricane. The US, no, that study where uh, hurricane intensified and then. Uh, uh, so during that time, it was indeed uh, all weather systems, uh, big systems. So there are no engineering supported by any of the W. With selected seeding, you can divert yeah, well, uh, research studies. Yeah. Sir is talking about yeah, research I think studies. What what you say, I completely concur, because I live in Pondicherry and Tamil Nadu and. We actually count you know, how many cyclone systems came last season. We must have at least as many this year because that's the main source of rainfall. That's absolutely true. But, but I thought that um, it's something to think about well, perhaps much later, later whether, whether these should be priority areas or not. Completely non priority areas. Now it's only at a research grade. But what I will be talking about even later during this talk, perhaps will be more preposterous so that engaging society through through other means. I would like your opinions on all of that. This is done. Yeah. So a little bit about. Um, so this is very high end research happening in many universities around the world to avert terraforming, avert heat stresses, inducing <laughs> rain in rain starved areas and then, but did our ancients have a foreknowledge and intuitive awareness of how to live more comfortably? I think the answer is yes, and I'm going to talk a little, the word of riparian, riparian means anything to do with water. Tamil Nadu and Karnataka always have riparian disputes about the sharing of Kaveri waters. Um, here, this was Siddharth's, part of Siddharth's PhD work. Siddharth, why don't you, very briefly, two or three minutes, why don't you talk about it? So, uh, this was a case study for the city of Chennai when uh, it received a lot of precipitation uh, back in 2015. Uh, some stations uh, recorded almost 500 millimeters of rainfall within a single day, uh, region of Anchipuram. So you can see, this is from the news article where uh, you can see inundation uh, within the city. And uh, the picture onto the right, uh, it shows natural uh, water reservoirs in Anna Nagar and Avadi, which usually get filled up during intense precipitation events. But what has been happening recently is that a lot of urbanization has taken place around these water reservoirs. So not only do these uh, water reservoirs get filled up, but a lot of water gets uh, into these uh, uh, urbanized areas. And we found that uh, this was mainly happening in the North Chennai region, with <laughs> the low-lying region, and has uh, shanty towns, slums, where a lot of uh, farmers, laborers, fishermen, daily wage laborers they live and they are the most vulnerable people yeah, some just statistics that 
uh, in Chennai, almost 1049 millimeters of rainfall was received during this during two weeks, uh, last week, I mean, uh, the end of November and first week of December. And this is just a synoptic picture from the IMD website on the left, where you can see bands of intense convective activity in Chennai. And we did some uh, work where we the first step was to compare the, the modeled precipitation rates with the observation with the RM3 RD precipitation rates. And not only, I mean, the broad contours were very captured, the precipitation streets, but the rain rates also sort of agreed quite favorably. But the whole idea was to uh, isolate vulnerable regions in the North Chennai area. And we found that the populated areas of Uttiur, Manali, Madhavaram, Goliarpet, and Royapuram, where, I mean, these areas house the most vulnerable population, they get completely inundated during intense precipitation events. And the blue lines, if you can see, are actually the main river tributaries, the main river bodies, which splits into sub tributaries in cyan color. So this point of spillage is actually called the pore point or the spill point, which sets out water in these zones. So we calculated the drainage flow rates in these regions and then back calculated the submergence depths, the inundation depths. It was about 0.3 to 0.6 meters. And uh, some articles, some reports, uh, the Red Atlas developed by the ministry also reported depths of about, about that uh, range, 0.3 to 0.6 meters. Thank you. Thank you, Hidan. So this is coming back to ancient settlements. And we did some study in the Mandya district of Karnataka. And we I took my entire class. Um, this was a course that I was teaching energy in the built environment. And this was a thousand year old Jain settlement. And again, part of his roof project, they're now at Carnegie Mellon doing computer science identical twins. And um, so what we hear, you're not allowed to fly drones. It's a uh, protected area. So we side photographs. And this also had a huge media when this was published. And we had a very tough time with a reviewer. So basically, Europe was undergoing a massive heat wave, England was 40 degrees centigrade with the pitch melting on London streets. So, you know, they give all these catchy, sensational things, early air conditioning. Um, to, that's Western media for you. What was done here, the first thing is, uh, they chose where they wanted to live and designed the housing very uniquely. So here, this is a hilltop, and you can see a granite skirted reservoir. And it is so deep that even if the monsoon failed twice in two successive years, there would be enough stored rainwater. And uh, so this is a piece the Renaissance, and they had this, perhaps their religious predilections made them to venerate water. Um, the first challenge was to estimate the area of the exposed surface, because if you have hot winds blowing over exposed surface, you'd have the effects of hydraulic air conditioning. So, Sagar and Sami, they wrote a script using AI and ML, so where they converted blurred images into very sharp images to get that area right. That was the first challenging. So they used a technique called histogram equalization, where uh, you the boundary demarcations. So, th so this is briefly what they did. And to cut a long story short, we had a fairly acu accurate assessment of the depth and the area of the rainwater covered surface. A little bit about thermal comfort. Um, I think all of you know all this. It was in the 70s when Panger developed indices for thermal comfort for mammals with a four-chambered heart, which are human beings. 
So he introduced a scale based on the predicted mean vote, a seven point scale um, where zero is absolutely comfortable or the negative temperatures, you're very cold and positive, high positives, you're extremely warm. So um, then the American Society for Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning, they still use this. I was discussing this with uh, Dr. Cole that these indices have a very mid-latitude affluent society bias. And we have to rethink doing our own scales. And luckily, the SEPT University in Ahmedabad, they're trying to work on a new scale. So what, what we did in this study was we wanted to have a temperature profiling of the lived-in areas. So we, we immediately noticed that they worked with composite materials. And in smart buildings, if you have joineries with air gaps, it kind of retards the heat transmission. So the first thing, if you, if you do building physics, you have to calculate the U value of the material. I noticed that but you have a smart building here with chilled water, underwater pipes. We have that in VIT as well. And uh, you must have a special building fabric that retards the transmission of heat. So this is very simple. We did some simulations. So R is a water reservoir. We, were, we showed that you have, when you have hot winds of a certain speed flowing over a water surface, you get very, very nice comfort in index. So we use the physiological equivalent temperature, which is a better indicator of human thermal comfort and with that without the reservoirs and that clinched the paper. So it should, yes. Yeah. So again, this was um, engineering modeling about what might be the temperature and the comfort in this. So what I wish to comment upon the fact that I think they chose to align their buildings through an intuitive awareness. Where should we position the temple? Where should we position the dormitory? What would be the aperture uh, of the areas so that it receives chilled and hydrated air? And whilst in IITM, I spent most of my time working here in the balcony. The glazing ratio was where glazing ratio is the ratio of the window to the wall. Buildings with high glazing ratio will foster ventilation, especially displacement ventilation. And then, so that's the kind of study we did. And this is a deep connection with, and we showed with different glazing ratios, uh, what, what, how comfortable you would be inside. The but, uh, yes, but is it the reservoir that made the largest uh, difference? Absolutely, it was a stretched water body. In fact, in this paper, we said that in the gated communities, if you must have a swimming pool, at least orient your towers, knowing the meteorological profiling. Generally, the towers are oriented for convenience. It has to be aligned to the city grid. There are space constrictions. None of this is considered. But if you have a full meteorological profiling for eight months of the year, the hottest winds are blowing. See, we have a regular pattern of wind flow, the southwest monsoon, the northwest. It ensures the winds are blowing in a preferred direction. So if, if you orient yourself just like the Arathurians, that and, and the logarithmic profile, the upper towers, the winds are stronger, then in fact, there's something called the Alliance for Energy Efficiency. It's a New Delhi-based organization. They are looking at the setting of air conditioning temperatures. Even a two degree difference in temperature will save the city of New Delhi millions of dollars. So, it's, so we have to relook how we position new buildings, how we structure new cities. I have a question. 
Yes. So yes. You, you mentioned in the gated community, we have if we have a swimming pool, let's align it uh, towards the, the housing. Yes. Yes. So, but the first thing you mentioned that 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 the Jain settlement they had a huge water body, but the swimming pools we have in the gated communities are smaller. So that's the first thing. So we have a size constraint or surface area of the swimming pool. The other thing is that in these days when there are 40 stories building, 30 stories building, and the swimming pool is at the ground level, so how much will it affect? I think this is a very relevant question. You're saying that the efficiency of hydraulic air conditioning is proportionate to the exposed water surface. Okay, that's that's absolutely true. But you may have if you have lived in North India and when we have very dry summers, a simple de desert cooler where you have some exposed water body and you're forcing hot air onto your desert water and forcing it, it does lower the room temperature by two degrees. I've done that experiment myself. So if a square tank, one meter square, is causing an impact on a 10 by 12 room, Surely a swimming pool will be able to uh, chill the rampants. May not be as as mm -hmm. much, but it's a very relevant question. Uh, but it will it will at least the orientation plus the presence of the water body will bring down the temperatures by two degrees. And my next part was we have a very high story building now. It is a thirty story, forty story. So. Just, up, up yes. Yes. So just cooling at the bottom, will this also decrease temperature at the top floors? No, it won't. It won't. But you must remember that the winds are stronger in the top floor because of the logarithmic wind, wind profiles. So adjustments can be, you must optimize the higher wind speeds on the upper floor. Even that is not done. Uh, Ivan, yeah. you would trigger uh, uh, Dr. Shivsai Dixit uh, here a little bit because uh, uh, he did some experiments uh, on our roof. Uh, actually, used uh, white yeah. paint, reflective paint, and uh, maybe you should tell yes. something. In this. Uh, so, uh, front building of IITM. Um, when I joined, uh, I joined in 2013 January, so that was a comfortable <laughs> month. Then when we entered April, I was sitting on the top floor and um, just started because that time we did not have these solar panels also. So it was directly heating and we were in a, 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 a or some, some sort of a cell inside. Um, and I proposed uh, that we should um, try this, uh, is this doctor fix it uh, reflective paint? Yes. So if you put that paint, it looks white, but so white that you can't even look at it. It's so reflective. So I propose that, uh, you know, two rooms, my room and the room next to me. We'll choose these two rooms as uh, for the experiment. And uh, on the top, the roof, I mean, the, the roof we will put my room conveniently. <laughs> so and uh, then the next room, we won't have the coating on the top. And uh, because these two rooms are side by side, uh, the uh, the solar uh, insulation angles and all that is not going to make much yeah. difference. So it's they're exposed to the same level of uh, heating. Uh, and then we can look at how this reflective thing matters. And then I would just put, uh, you know, regular thermometers in both rooms. And um, I documented something like around 1.5 to 2 degrees of difference between yes. two adjacent rooms. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, the coating was just on the top of my room. So if you have coating over the entire uh, roof, then even the lateral uh, uh, diffusion effects would be uh, minimal. So it would be even more effective if you put it on the entire roof. That's something which we did in 2013 and 14. So I made a small report and then needed to yeah, so but yeah, it takes very and that just two degrees of difference is very effective Absolutely. because it it's not just two degrees, it also matters where it occurs, right? So if it occurs so, at 40 degrees or 38 degrees, two degrees makes much of a difference. In fact, you know that 
Yeah, thank you for sharing that wonderful story. I think two things. So basically, the albedo effect is the white paint, right. and so when the when the thin air of fluid, which is slightly cooler, is in contact with, you know, the fabric, the roof fabric, which has a certain specified thermal transmittivity. So uh, there is a this is a classic problem as heat transfer on a flat plate with with a radiative surface. But thank you for sharing that. Um, so again, you know, um, continue the same theme as you can see that uh, Anuradhapura is a world heritage city in Sri Lanka. Again, I went there five times to do a project with my students and we we looked at hydro, you know, the house. It's a very rain stopped area. So the shallow pools of water and uh, for the first time in the world, 2000 years ago. So this is the last case study. Um, you referred, sir, you talked about Tamil Nadu and the precipitation. We want cyclonic systems to dump pitch rainfalls. So the ancient Cholans, they built this very iconic dam called the Kalanai Dam. So want to want, wanted to store the waters in the Kaveri. Kaveri is, of course, entirely warm rain and the sources from the Ghats, unlike the Himalayan glaciers. But just to put in context that we in our country have an iconic dam, which is as ancient as many of the other well-established dams. So a little bit of, so the reach of the Cholas spread to much of South Asia. And uh, yes. So about the heritage, this is an edict. And this is a translation of the greatness of the Kaveri. And we are still continuing to work on this project, combining climate modeling and hydrological modeling, the results of which I will show in a minute. So it fosters agriculture, inundation and flash, flash floods. So we had one last year, and we have modeled the October flash floods and the impact it has on this iconic structure. But I noticed that this tank culture is quite prevalent all over Tamil Nadu. All the Tamil temples don't have tank cultures, perhaps for cooling the rampants and also for their water needs. So that's the timeline started in the first century AD and then <laughs> reinforced it. And now again, Siddharth will talk about he he, he does is working on this at the moment. So as you can see, the study region is centered over the Kalanai region, the Kalanai Dam. And uh, this is the Kalanai Dam here on the right, with the Koli Dam River towards the end. And these are villages which are routinely inundated because of extreme events. And uh, they are the ones who, have, who also are agricultural I mean, they are agrarian people and they cultivate, they do paddy and banana cultivation only. So the idea was to uh, link, couple the climate model outputs with the hydrological model to find out the vulnerable regions and see the submergence depths uh, in the area. So uh, the outputs from a WRF model were, were coupled with the hydrological model, the HECRAS model, along with GIS-based uh, uh, procedures, which involved uh, land use, land category information, soil map, and the stream routing maps. So stream routing, routing maps uh, help us find out the uh, the stream, the, the way the, the rivers and the, uh, in the tributaries will flow and the accumulation zones within the region. And uh, this yielded inundation maps. And as you can see, a uh, picture onto the right, the built up areas and agricultural areas were completely inundated. This is just a bit behind his drone facilities. We wanted to see upstream flooding as well as downstream flooding. After a three day precipitation event in August last year. So, this is a spillway and the shoots. So, the OG spillway can see a lot of flooding. 
and there were three sub. But what is interesting, what we are doing is we did a 2050 simulation, a warmer planet simulation. So the so the government of India guidelines, you multiply the depth, depth of the water, and the velocity of the waters, and then issue alert zones, red, orange, yellow. So we found that subbase since that are safe now are completely unsafe uh, at the, at the, by 2050. What was the reason? Uh, because of well, it, because of global warming, no, it induces short duration intense precipitation events. So this we are specifically looking at a short, and that's going to be the new norm. You know, global warming will have more intense precipitation events over short durations. So now I think, uh, Dr. Dixit, about your white paint and orientation and alignment comes in. Gold cone, located in Pondicherry, on the southeast coast of India, designed by Antonin Raymond and George Nakashima in 1935 as a multi-story dormitory of Sri Aurobindo's ashram. This building has a world stature, both architecturally and in its bioclimatic response to a tropical, warm and humid climate. It has the reputation of being a well-maintained, comfortable building, although it has no mechanical cooling system. While gaining from the practical experience acquired in the vernacular buildings of Pondicherry, the architects have tried to translate them into materials that are offered by the modern world. The local climatic conditions were taken into consideration and the building was given the most logical shape dictated by the local conditions. It is an exposed, reinforced concrete frame structure with traditional lime plaster on the brick walls. The fundamental principles of architecture, simplicity, economy, beauty, and closeness to nature were consciously and consistently observed. Golconde is truly timeless in its essence and a masterpiece of architecture. The roof is made of large and thin precast curved cement concrete elements, creating a ventilated airspace over the third floor concrete slab. The ends of these precast curved elements on the north and south are sealed with perforated concrete slabs. The double roof was important because of the almost continual intense heat of the tropics. The convection of air keeps the top floor rooms almost as cool as the ones below. Both north and south facades are fully openable with louvers, which can be fully opened, half opened or closed by a series of simple state-of-the-art brass bars with notches to adjust the angles. Interestingly, all along the north facade, there is first the corridor which connects all the rooms. The decision to keep the corridor in the north side is an important one since Golconde is situated on 12 degree north latitude with summer sun penetrating on the north. This is how the rooms are kept cool all the year round, even in the hot. Yeah. So basically it was the orientation and the perforations on the top that there are holes in the ceiling. So the hot air is lighter, it goes towards the ceiling. The cold air is denser, so hot air is flushed away from the roof. I have lived in the bone uh, for a week. You, you don't need fans at all. And this was done in 1936. This was a precursor to all the modernism that we are doing in Oroville. You know, it's the world's only international township. They're experimenting on all of this.
This was done in 1936. But, so a little bit about Drew mentioned that he invited you to the World, World, World Wildlife Conservation. You went there. This he told me. So you gave a talk to them. And so we went to Masai Mara. This is when he was working with World WW the UK to talk to them. Yeah. So we were looking at a magnata and modes of heat transmission. So you have different layers against the composite material. We did a full uh, heat transmission pathway. Siddharth went to TU Delft. And uh, so just some applications and uh, Now I'm coming to the end of my book. So much of what I talked is published in this, this book. And um, Professor Lord Hunt wrote a foreword for this book. I'm very pleased about that. And I went, went to give it to him. And this is the House of Lords. He, was an he's, he is an extraordinary person. I said anecdotes. They once he took me there, and he there was a circle in the House of Lords, and he said, "Santa, I want you to trample on this." I said, "Why are you asking me to do this?" He said, "Do as I said. We just walk on it." He said, "This was the point that the British Raj was conceived. The Raj doesn't exist, so therefore I ask you to walk on it." That that is that is Julian, and. Uh, Yes. So this is where I would really like comments from IITM. I noticed kind of artwork of this library building. So the European Commission is giving a lot of money for climate scientists to work with artists. You have residency program, and the whole idea is um, just as Amita Ghosh. It's, it's trying to bring in literature to epic proportions, to bring in public uh, awareness. So I think society needs more than graffiti installations along walls. We see a lot of beautiful artworks, even on police streets. Some major commissioning of artworks telling a story with climate themes. So then the airport lounges and other public places so that the message comes across loud and clear. So based on the gold cone inspiration, and because I am from Pondicherry, I invited a famous London artist to work with me on a project in, in Pondicherry. This is called the Fish House Project. This building is a green building opposite a fish market, wow. therefore the fish house. And we were discussing what kind of art might work on a building so that People are sensitive to the wind flow patterns. We just saw in, on, in the gold cone that uh, you have a certain type of wind flows, and that kind of art must replicate uh, so that everyone who walks past the building have a feel of the wind. I'm going to play a little video. Uh, she's called Tanya Ling, and I'm still working with her. So now. I normally work in London in some extraordinary places like warehouses, department stores, strange buildings, even schools. When Harper invited me to have a show in LA this September, I thought, you know what, I want to make work outside in the sun. We're in Somis on VH Farm, which is about an hour and 10 minutes north east of downtown LA, across and through some mountains and canyons in the countryside. There's 2,500 lemon trees. There is quite a few horses, and they're very special horses. Everything has been so different around the paintings, and I haven't been able to control it and manage it. I've just had to accept it and keep going.
got these big canvases that act like sails that fall on you. I've got wasps and bees and hummingbirds and the wind and sometimes really, really gets hot and your ears start burning. And the paintings themselves, they've got all of that in them. So some of them have been a bit... So basically, the landscape that come into the painting, so that, that idiom works. And I'll, I'll just read a little bit. This is my first reading of my book, Anywhere in the World. I'm going to do this in England when I go back. So it's, it's my privilege that I'm able to do this to you. Thank you, Dara. So a little bit about what she says about this. Tanya Ling states that my paintings have been referred to as wave paintings, in part because of the color of the ultramarine ink, but also because the individual lines, although static, describe movement and form, which unpredictably contrasts and expands in three dimensions. The form organically dips, weaves, and rolls. Professor Dixit, it's free mechanics. Uh, in this respect, the paintings could be an attempt to describe the moving water or perhaps the movement of wind, so essential on buildings close to a seafront, in that the decorative motif would reflect the adjoining ocean a building faces. So you just can't have any, any painting on any building wall. That is why, you know, a duo project between a climate scientist and an artist. So. Now, is this only a modern concept? No. Again, the ancient Tamils, and I'm so proud to be part of Tamil Nadu. This is Arjuna's penance, um, a bar relief on route to Mamallapuram, and you can see all the sentient beings, but it was the artist's intention that he said he has two flanks and there's a gully. It was the artist's intention that the painting is best viewed when there's a monsoon shower falling on it. The rain is going through the gully and it's spraying the spray and the mist. And uh, I write about this in my, in my book as well. So there you see an embedded of nature coming into a great work of art, even 2,000 years ago. And, and it is time we revived it to send across the climate message. Coming to the very end, um, so many of you will be going to the IUGG, and I will be very interested to know if people are thinking about um, activism of some form, after how to arrest terraforming. And this is Susan Solomon. Why I bring in here is when she read her book, The Coldest Mark, Susan Solomon was spearheaded. Even global warming might be reversed, but it should be a different kind of inter and, and interaction. So the last slide is, you know, great works of literature have impacted society so profoundly. So when the Uncle Tom's Haven was released, that was a precursor to the abolishing of slavery. And A.J. Cronin's Citadel, that was the precursor to the UK's National Health Service. And, and so perhaps, you know, a deeper engagement of climate scientists with um, artists might reverse terraforming. I, I, will, I want to read for two minutes from my book and you have a choice. So basically, if you wish, I could read about why a climate scientist might want to interact with an artist, or how Julian Hunt showed me how to present science to the public. What shall I read? First. Se <laughs> second one? OK, sure. And that, that will be the end. So in fact, I tell that to my students, it has stuck to me so much.
think it's with the end. Yeah. Yes. So this is from my. <clears throat> so basically, this is the first week in DMTP. I just come and um, I'll end this with an account of how I was gently shown the art of writing up research. Taking up academic position requires certain obvious skills. Skills of oration and lecture delivery, skills to write up project proposals for procuring research grants, skills to present papers in workshops and seminars, among others. But most importantly, perhaps the most difficult is to write a good journal paper. No one ever breathed down your neck at Cambridge. We worked at our own pace generally, and I had spent close to two months without writing up any research. So one afternoon, I left a 10-page written-up document with Julian for his comments and suggestions. A week went by, and I was hoping that I would be called for a discussion. I was called in the following week. I knocked and heard the user. Come in. Hi, Sat. How are you? Shall we have some tea as we dis discuss your paper? I said I'd love one and was already feeling nervous. We sat down with our empty mugs and the tea ladies poured us our tea and we came back to Julian's office and sat down on a chair next to a pine wood table piled with books and notes with written up text, sketches and equations, photocopies of papers and lots of pencils. I asked, was the write-up okay? He said, oh, sat, it had all the needed information. But to write a good paper, a lot more needs to be done. He pulled out a notepad and drew a concept diagram, which immediately set the scene pictorially, even for a complex applied mathematical paper. And then he pulled his chair a little more closely and had a sip of tea from his mug. I did the same and sense that he was about to tell me something important. Look, Sat, imagine you were asked to write an essay about your last trip to Sainsbury's. You could start by writing an account of what aisles A, B, C, and D contained. Instead, if you began by saying, as I walked in with Chris that Friday afternoon for my weekly food shopping, I immediately noticed that a pot of honey was on special offer with crumpets, and they are to be found at the farthest end of aisle B as you head towards the cash tins. Wouldn't that be a more interesting account? So your research must never, ever read like a report. So that's then. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for giving, taking us through your books yeah. and uh, giving a wide array of uh, topics that are actually making everyone think. And the, maybe that we should uh, uh, get questions. Sure. May I present the, this is for IITM library. Oh, that is Thank great, Shropa. Thanks. Great. It's not available at Amazon. It's sold out. Uh -huh. so, okay. so, uh, thank yes. you so much. Yeah. There's a comment in the uh, online or did, or did it respond it? Oh, that's yeah. Yeah. Oh, there is a piece. Well, we check that uh, you, you threw in a lot of ideas and about uh, yeah. books and all. So, uh, I mean, this era when uh, fewer people are reading fewer books and watching less arts, probably. I don't know the statistics, but I feel like. Question. What, uh, I mean, how do you think, if what are the best ways to reach both public and policy makers? In what do you feel? Yes. He wants something. So shall I, Tara, shall I answer? I definitely this love There is one, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, please I'll, answer. I'll to yeah, you please answer. Yes. yes, I think that's quite a deep question. The first thing is, um, I'm sure you know this, the sale of books actually have gone up over the years, despite people reading on Kindle and reading blogs. Um, that's one point to note. 
And, and I'm also buying a lot of books. But yes. Really. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see, I see. <laughs> yes. So uh, how how to reach out? Um, I think one way to reach out is to uh, uh, maybe Tara should comment. What short short film speed um, and. In the, in the local vernacular. In fact, when you when I go back next week, I'm talking to an artist, sort of artist activist in Pondicherry. Um, she's she trained at the Bengal School of Art and in and in Paris. So basically, how to use walls more effectively. One simple example: a mural has been done in a street where people dumped garbage. Um, so I think what she does regularly, she calls in the local fisherwomen and, and, and the men who make the nets. She does workshops with local people and gives video demonstrations quite regularly. You know, I'm involved with it. And she microfinances some of the projects through various agencies because Pondicherry being the hub of many organizations, including Oracle. So one way is to create working groups locally. Uh, that's one way. And the other is, uh, I think people have already started library at your doorstep. This has happened in Chennai. So they, they come and give you books and ask for your preferences and you're given, given books which you read. And in England, I found something very interesting is when you finish reading a book on the tube, you just leave it on your seat and then don't take it away with you. And this is what, what are your ideas? I think this short video has a yes. wide reach and, you know, gets shared in what yes. has huge impact as well. Yes, yes. And also in some, some... Now, sir, uh, the, in Pune city, there is a lot of uh, painting going on, right, on the walls and all. Uh, but I think think, yeah, also, also the new the highway, new highways being constructed. A lot of painting is going on. I think we must also have a city there. Right? You have a good painting outside. Yeah, we yes. have. But we have to have other places also. Yeah. Not just Indi, you know, Tanya was saying that she does a lot of assemblages. Huge. She did, she did the British Embassy in Tokyo, all the interior space. So basically, we're thinking of a model for a cyclone, and I've written about that, you know, the outer bands are much more convective and active, and the center is still in, so maybe a huge sculpture that will rotate, that will show the spinning and, you know, the divergence, I mean, brilliant artists can think of various things on a very large scale. To, so this was the second part. Do you think this is going to work in India? Using art and literature uh, for climate action? Possibly. I think we need all, I mean, all kind of uh, medium. Training the villages, yes. All kind of languages. I've seen that, I mean, just to just comment on that, I've seen that uh, uh, whatever it is, whether it's video, TV and all, uh, finally, uh, you can reach a huge, broader uh, audience through newspapers, printed newspapers, yes. definitely. And that has an impact in, in the sense, uh, I've seen uh, even policymakers or politicians bring those newspapers to, uh, you know, the, the either the parliament or their name is about, and uh, you know, based on that, uh, citing information that, and asking for climate action, and also the public as well using it uh, effectively. So newspapers definitely have a long reach. Absolutely. Now, I'm sure it's like that. I find that in Tamil Nadu, I'm amazed. You know, these elderly citizens around them, they constantly reading a newspaper or a little booklet. That that, that doesn't happen in Bengal at all anymore. Uh, it used to answer, but but in Tamil Nadu people read newspapers quite a lot. Perhaps also. it's gone down. Uh, I think uh, the recent generation uh, youngsters, like my students and all, many of them do not read newspapers. I think uh, in hostels and all, newspapers are not subscri subscribed, which is 
Yes, yes. Uh, I, I will actually we we have one uh, question. Hands up. Uh, uh yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. Yes. Hello. So I'm. Uh, I found your talk very fascinating. As someone, uh, so I'm a former student of IITM. I did my PhD there, and I also identify as an artist. And I strongly believe in the uh, force of art and literature to um, bring movements to life and sustain them as well. So uh, I was quite fascinated by your uh, discussion on the on how architecture has played a role in uh, climate. Uh, mitigation or sort of you know creating structures and I was wondering if you and uh, probably your students Siddharth have uh, looked at the tribal architectures in Meghalaya where they have bridges which are completely formed simply by uh, you know sort of uh, giving direction to roots and branches so that uh, they, they of course need a lot a little more maintenance than what a concrete structure would but it's a very beautiful way of integrating nature into architecture and also without having to uh, how can i say this uh, disturbing nature or trees and other ecological systems so i was wondering if you had any comments on that and yes. whether that can be brought into mainstream where well, that has always been my uh, question you know that i mean can you can we envision a at least a part of a town where the bridges may not be made of say concrete or metal but perhaps with uh, ecological factors trees and other uh, natural things just would like well love to hear your thoughts thank you aditi for such such a nice comment and question yes i am aware of you know an entire bridge in meghalaya which is made out of roots and trees um i have seen a documentary on that in fact that entire area also there was a movement about um accessibility to sort of homestays in meghalayas which are perhaps among the best in the country where there's no littering they're sensitized about littering uh vis-a-vis -vis -vis homestays and um so what Professor Roxy and um, Professor Tara Prabhakaran mentioned, I think one way to bring uh, climate themes is perhaps have a coordinated effort on having uh, field visits to certain parts where uh, such activities have already happened. For instance, we have a certain idiom in Tamil Nadu, the, the tank culture in Tamil Nadu, which stores rainwater harvesting. And we have a certain different idiom in Meghalaya, which, which is, you know, being so wet and green and lush, how, how to manage uh, the green resources in the built environment. Um, so that, that is one way documenting, uh, documenting the, such things and also talking to the people. And uh, another thing which I haven't, so we have a very rich tradition of Sustain, sustainable living in local communities involving artists. So we are trying to do that in Pondicherry where we bring fishermen and weavers uh, and sensitize. So we could we could ask them to do motives on their side. You see the Kalamkari tradition of yes. painting. Yes. They have mythological themes mainly. Absolutely. We, we can have secular themes on Kalamkari sari. I'm mm -hmm. just thinking aloud. Yeah. Would you well, be interested? Would you be interested to work with me? Oh, absolutely. Um, Actually, uh, I have a couple of inputs because since you asked if there are things which can work in Pune, so uh, I'm part of a few groups and being an educator, I also uh, interact a lot with young students. So one uh, author by the name Bijal V who writes uh, fiction, uh, climate fiction specifically for children. Uh, aged up to 11 to 15 because uh, and her stories are very beautiful so there's this book called a cloud named Bura, which is essentially a pollution based cloud and how it has an effect not just on the people for, in terms of their breathing and health but also on their moods and there's like an entire story viewed through it and uh, so there are of course i encourage my students to read uh not just you know the papers and journals but also this type 
type of reading uh, there is a group which uh, is sort of trying to beautify the old part of pune wherein the old uh, shops which were basically hole in the wall kind of shops but now they have to have shutters and all they did a volunteer work to sort of uh, paint them for free and put them with a lot of pop culture and uh, sort of themed with what the shop would sell let's say a hardware store would have you know a lot of pop culture based screwdrivers and Lot of art put over there, so that is one thing. Also, there's another group called uh, of there's citizen science groups in Pune. So one of them has been working on uh, keeping a track of how monsoon is changing in the city. Plus, there are tree walks which take place very regularly. I was part of the last spring walk where they uh, go to certain areas in Pune where the very first trees which were planted by the community before Pune became a city. those are still maintained and we sort of document how those trees are kept and how they are maintained and uh, there's a lot of such type of work so yes i mean i would absolutely thank love you. to get in touch with you thank you so much absolutely sure sure thank you thank you tara ma'am for the thank beautiful you. arrangement anybody else having questions yes 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 please yes 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 I don't know. I have to talk to Macmillan if they have an audio. Yeah. I would like to add two things. In the very beginning, you showed that uh, the distribution of water in different reservoirs, right? Where you showed the uh, matter in the the right. bottom, you had a lot of the largest reservoir in the mantles and everywhere in the earth crust below the earth crust. Yes, 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 yes. That's the Wallace Wallace and Hawks. So then. actually recently there was a study which is published in jrl somewhere that uh, this is not from that deep water even the the normal uh, our borewell waters the if we had draw down a uh, huge amount of water actually it affected the spin and the uh, the inclination of the earth and as i read that i read the case so if you go for that deep and start pulling out that water then we even remember that deep which is not in the form of liquid water because as you go down it is so hot it's entirely in the form of steam so it's not liquid water and the wobbling of this uh, this is the excretion of ground water which is so dense so that that this study i read that article which says that it's affecting the spin so, so basically the temperature is like yes but this is you know you can't dig beyond i think 2 or 3 kilometers it is so hot digging to the core is not possible so if technology evolves that is in the form of steam sir it's not liquid water so some condensation mechanism if new technology will have to get the steam up and then condense it and make it liquid water it only steam or there are uh, some uh, complex between other with other chemicals also i think oh i mean there are there are signatures of other but it's predominantly steam If you have to get water out of it, you have to condense it. Yes. Anybody else? So, uh, then uh, finish by thanking uh, Professor Dosh. Uh, because uh, I actually I think. Uh, many of us here are at least getting sensitized about the there there are many other things also at or we have to indeed come um the oh, i think this example that you are giving us to your book and the work that you just did yeah especially for the young students who have come to listen to you there are many i think uh, they will take it forward some some of the messages you want to thank you i'm 